find that uh, from Ottoman era to the Republic of Turkey. And Nessie would like to, I'm sure he will explain it as well, uh, cover the Turkey Republic mostly during his talk, uh, 35, 40 minutes. And then during the questions, you are more than welcome to ask questions about the Ottoman Empire as well. Um, just briefly introduce Nessie. I will introduce Nessie. And then Nessie, we are ready when you're ready to listen to your talk. Uh, Nessie is a member of the shrinking Jewish community of Turkey. Uh, he was born in Turkey. Uh, you said that you were born in Turkey, right, Nessie? Yes, um, he is a writer and, and, and uh, uh, the editor uh, of an online Jewish publication called Avlaremos. Uh, Nessie holds an MA in political science from McGill University. His academic interests are minorities in both the contemporary Middle East and in the late Ottoman history, as well as identity in Turkey. Uh, he has done work on Jewish migration from Van. Van is a, is a small city in East Turkey in the Kurdish region. Uh, the Sephardi uh, citizenship uh, restitutions from Spain and Portugal and the Kurdish peace process in Turkey. Uh, so his writings in English, Turkish and Ladino uh, has been published in uh, many outlets. Nessie is currently living in Montreal, but as I said, he's joining us from Istanbul today. Over to you, Nessie. Thank you. Um, so as, uh, as the other explained, um, I today will be focusing my hopefully quick talk to the 23, 1960 period, which I think is a quite unknown time for people outside of Turkey and only recently in Turkey, people have started to discuss this period. Um, but obviously I would be happy to talk within questions about the period before and since. So contemporary issues as well. Uh, we could yeah, get to as much of that as, as we want. Um, and being mindful of time, I'll just jump right in. Um, so today's plan is that I want to walk us through sort of the two periods that that uh, span covers. The one party republic from 20, 23 to 46, which is uh, the founding of Turkey, and then from the post-war period until the 1960 coup, um, where there's some different dynamics at play. Um, and some of the topics I'm going to be touching on are this question of like naming Jews in Turkish, the, the problem of language politics, particularly with Medino, uh, the murder of a young woman named Niego, a pogrom, a discriminatory tax, uh, the effects of the Holocaust on Turkey and Jews from Turkey. Um, and in the later period in the post-war section, we're going to talk about the Democrat party, mass migration, coups, and hopefully we'll get to these other things, especially the kind of the Dino uh, in questions. Um, and I choose to begin neatly here, but I wanna highlight that the 1908 to 1923 period is extremely important. And we'll, we can definitely talk more about that uh, if you want with the events like the occupation of Edirne and then of Istanbul and Izmir. These all shape Jewish political outlook and memory. And I'll be focusing mostly in this talk on the Ladino speaking Sephardim who make up the majority of the population in Turkey. Uh, but it's important to highlight the existence of Kurdish speaking, neo aramaic speaking, Arabic speaking, Greek speaking, Jewish communities as well. Um, so that we can also get to those communities in questions. Uh, so they get mostly assimilated into the overwhelmingly Sephardic culture uh, already in the Ottoman period and continuing through the Republic. Um, and we see that this is not a, this is not a talk about anti-Semitism in Turkey, it's about Jews. So there's a lot of Jews who are agents and they take actions, uh, they speak politically, they migrate, they vote with their feet and literally. So we're gonna talk about how Jews uh, act in the situations that they run into in this period. 
Um, I'm going to refer to many sources and feel free to ask uh, for further readings on anything I mentioned, but mostly I'll be going off of work by Avner Levi of Izmir and Rifat Bali of Istanbul, who are both very prolific writers. Um, uh, quick background on me uh, and how I'm approaching this topic. Uh, so Ken Soyo is a, who am I in Ladino. Uh, my family uh, is, this is my dad's side of the family, uh, are from Tekirda, which is uh, in the western part of Turkey over here uh, on the Sea of Marmara. Uh, my mother's family is from Istanbul. And one side of my dad's family is from Van um, over here on the Iranian border. Um, so uh, just within one family, you see there's a diversity of origins uh, within uh, Jews who then become citizens of the Turkish Republic. And when we look at who the Jews are in this, in this uh, area uh, that becomes Turkey in the year 1923, we can talk about two main population centers, um, despite the presence of Jews in further east and in Ankara, but mainly we're talking about the centers in uh, the Aegean region, centered around Izmir and Thrace, which is this region that borders Bulgaria and Greece and has uh, four provinces and Istanbul, so five provinces tucked into it. So Jews mostly uh, numbering around uh, 90,000 um, live in these areas and sorry, 90,000 in Istanbul and 150,000 in total. And we know that the communities in these places almost entirely speak Ladino at home or French uh, and a strong majority of the women, especially, were monolingual. Uh, the Jewish communities were large enough to host public celebrations of Purim in Izmir and Balat without much fear. Uh, however, especially the community of Izmir had been devastated by the war, um, which had destroyed the city. Uh, much of the city, though the Jewish quarter was uh, luckily untouched, much of the city of Izmir had burned, along with various cities further inland from Izmir, whose Jewish communities had to relocate. Uh, so there was a huge refugee problem, both in Izmir and in Istanbul, of Jews from neighboring towns affected by World War I and the independence war against Greece, who had congregated into these two major cities. Um, so with the over 150,000 Jews in Turkey in 1923, most of whom were Sephardic, nearly 90,000 were in Istanbul, so roughly 1% of the new country uh, was made up of Jews. Uh, this is a massive number looking back from today when Jews make up less than 0.01%, um, but a significant drop from the Ottoman Jewry that included most of the Balkans and importantly Salonika or Thessaloniki in Greece. So the community we're talking about when it comes to 1923 is much diminished uh, by people migrating and by people being left on the other side of the border. Um, and within, if we zoom in a little on Istanbul, we see that Jews live uh, in a few concentrated centers and you know, dispersed in smaller numbers throughout. But the main Jewish neighborhoods are Balat and Hasköy. Uh, this is Balat on the left, um, which are across the Golden Horn from each other, uh, for those of you who know Istanbul, are where the main Jewish neighborhoods um, they're quite uh, poor in this period. Um, and on the right, you see a Jewish neighborhood that becomes uh, even more popular as time goes on, uh, which is La Kula or uh, Galata, which is centered by the Galata Tower, uh, an old Genoese tower, next to which the Neve Shalom Synagogue was later built. That is currently the central synagogue of the Jews of Turkey. And while there were Jewish neighborhoods in these cities, uh, like Istanbul, these were not necessarily ghettos. Um, Jews chose to live with other Jews um, and often had Greek neighbors um, in Balat and Hasköy, and Bulgarians in Edirne and Turks in the Kula as well. So they were not exclusively Jewish, though overwhelmingly Jews chose to live in these areas. And here are some pictures from that period. 
um, we see uh, both industriousness and we see uh, war orphans. So this is a group of Jewish shoemakers from Istanbul. And this is a group of uh, Jewish war orphans in Izmir, all in the early 20s. Um, so this community in 1923 has come out of this extremely chaotic period of war and occupation and is trying to reconstitute itself with a much diminished population. And the new conditions that they are faced with um, include, um, include the country that they were not the primary citizens of. So I wanna talk about this through a quote from Ataturk, uh, who's the founder of the Republic. Uh, so he gave a speech to the Grand National Assembly saying that the nation that we're here to preserve and defend is of course not only compromised of one element, it is, compromised, it is composed of various Muslim elements. Uh, so while uh, he attests to the diversity of the citizens of the country and that all need to be united in, in, in uh, government, the elements he's talking about are only Muslims. The unity that we seek to achieve is not only of Turks or of Cherkes or Circassians, uh, but of Muslim elements that include all of these. Um, and in the first constitution, there's also a declaration of a state religion, which was later removed. Uh, but regardless, we're dealing with what some scholars have referred to as a contract of Muslimness. And over the first five years of the Republic, this view dominated, uh, though later it was suppressed uh, along with the suppression of Kurds, and it developed into more of a contract of Turkishness specifically that required Muslimness, but then added uh, a layer of Turkish language ability. Uh, it required two things of first-class citizenship, uh, nominal Sunni Muslim religion, which Jews could not fulfill, and speaking Turkish at home, uh, which some Jews, especially elites, were uh, extremely invested in doing, yet it was not a popular uh, language to speak among Jews, and it did not become so for a very long time. Um, and despite being identified as such, as Jews, uh, the government also at the same time popularized a new word in place of the more the existing word Yehudi meaning Jewish, which was Musevi. Um, the term Jew, Yehudi, became so corrupted in day-to-day -day speech that it became a slur of its own. So it had to be, again, in the eyes of the government, updated. So that's the sort of environment that we're talking about. Um, and this rebranding. Uh, has continued to this day. And we see that in this early period, uh, Jews can nominally have the rights as citizens, so they're supposed to act in, uh, in equal, uh, be acted upon in equal treatment, but they also face restrictions, even though they also have rights guaranteed as non-Muslims. So Western powers recognized the Republic with the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, uh, where the Turkish delegation actually included Haram Bashir Haim Nahum as an advisor. Um, the treaty had a section on minorities uh, that officially recognized the Greek Orthodox, Armenian, and Jewish communities uh, as minorities entitled to rights, but none of the other communities were, were recognized. Uh, this gave them the right to use their own language, uh, teach their national, which is going to become important, national language in school, uh, using their community communal practices and family law and communal uh, and communal uh, organization through under the aegis of the chief rabbinate for Jews. However, under extreme duress from the government, uh, first the Jewish community and then the Greek and Armenian communities unilaterally uh, gave up these privileges. Um, in the same period, we also see uh, the pressures of Turkification bear on Jews. Uh, for example, uh, a great number of uh, non-Muslim lawyers uh, get disbarred for unethical conduct. All public non-sector, uh, so all oh, sorry, all public sector non-Muslim employees are fired, and no new ones are hired. Um, no guns are provided uh, to non-Muslims, even when they're in mandatory military service. 
and the officer college entry exam is denied to non-Muslims. There's also different uh, rules about movement, which I find quite interesting and not much talked about. For example, there was a ban on any Jews residing in the province of Aydin, which is next to Izmir on the Aegean coast. A lot of the Jewish population of Aydin had to be relocated after a fire and the war in the early 1920s. And basically the government made it so that they could never return after they'd escaped to Izmir mostly. Um, we also see in the same period, police approval being required for inter-provincial travel. So within the country, uh, for uh, non-Muslims. Um, so this treatment as suspicious continues, uh, even though there's nominal equality. And one of the most important problems is language. Um, as the editor says uh, in 1931, a person who says he belongs to the Turkish nation should in the first place and under all circumstances speak Turkish. And uh, the then prime minister is mentioned concurs, all citizens who live in who live with us, so clearly making a distinction with us and the others who are still citizens but not us, must speak Turkish. Um, so this uh, pressure bears down visibly on Jews, Armenians, and Greeks. At this in this period in Istanbul, especially, Jews make up almost one in ten, or a little less, uh, like five percent, uh, more or less, of the population. Uh, that's quite a visible uh, population, and it's also similar in other major cities in the west, the western part of the country, in Edirne, in Bursa, in Izmir. Uh, for example, uh, the government decides that to push these languages like Ladino, Armenian, and Greek out of the public sphere, uh, they're going to start a campaign called Citizen Speak Turkish. And the pressure for that really comes from the bottom. The local elites of different cities are the ones more willing than the government uh, in the center to start this campaign. Uh, in July 1925, uh, two people speaking Ladino in Bursa uh, were fined by the municipal government after the release of an ordinance in the city, a municipal ordinance, that all residents were required to speak Turkish as the language of all citizens uh, in all public space. Um, and this extreme local fervor then gets swept up into the official campaign of the whole country that begins in 1928. And it's created such laws and massive social pressure uh, that Jews, among other minorities, had to recede their language into the home. While a national fine, like the one in Bursa, didn't take off, it was debated in parliament, uh, such laws were made at the provincial level, not only in Bursa, but in Edirne, Adana, Tekirda, Kırklareli, uh, throughout the 20s and 30s. Uh, and those are provinces with significant Jewish populations. Uh, but the pressure on language continued into the schools as well. Previously, up until this point, most Jews were educated in French-speaking schools. Um, but uh, as the as the Lausanne Treaty got interpreted by the Turkish government, they decided that first, uh, all schools need to introduce an increased amount of Turkish language. And even in minority schools, Turkish had to be taught by a Turkish teacher. Supposedly all citizens are Turkish, but this did not apply when it comes to the interpretation of the treaty. Uh, Turkish meant appointed by the government who's a Muslim. Um, and then putting further squeeze onto the schools, uh, the government interpreted national language teaching as uh, Hebrew. So the government decided that Jews' national language is Hebrew. Thus, the Jewish schools can teach in a non-Turkish language only if they chose Hebrew. At the time, there was no popular Hebrew speakership in Turkey. Uh, still, there is not. Um, and there was no teachers who could teach in such a way. So by default, French and religion were eliminated and all the schools had to become Turkish right away, which also meant all the teachers who were not used to teaching in Turkish had to be fired and Turkish teachers, Turkish Muslim teachers were brought in to replace them. And that kind of replaced the whole of the, of the Jewish education system basically in the late twenties and it never really went back to the way it was. And in that environment, uh, in 1927, we see, uh, 
this young woman named Elza Niego who got murdered uh, by Osman Ragape, who's a Turkish civil servant, um, who's much, much older than her. He became enamored with this woman and she rejected him repeatedly and complained about him to the police. Uh, yet in August, on August 17th, he stabbed her to death in broad daylight. He was arrested for this murder and Elza's funeral uh, was attended by thousands uh, of Jews in Galata where she lived, uh, which we can see the procession here. It was a major, uh, major uh, heartbreak for the entire community and it really mobilized a lot of people. And the next day, Turkish newspapers began cursing Jews for turning a funeral into a public dispersal, uh, disturbance, accusing them of swearing at Turkishness or clashing with police and causing disorder. Uh, this was not true. Uh, the newspapers also claimed that Jews chanted uh, down with the Turks, uh, which was an unthinkable uh, thing for a community under this much pressure. Uh, the event also illustrates the public hatred towards Jews in this period. Nine community leaders, including the secretary of the Galata community, were brought to court um, on charges of rioting and disrupting the police and incitement against a section of the public. Uh, they were accused of chance, hitting a Turkish man, and tried for months. Um, and the events following the murder uh, were really the high point uh, that we could describe of, what the, of a somewhat subdued environment. Um, and we then see uh, events turn even more violent. Um, for example, um, I think that the problem that occurs for this young man, um, Joseph, son of Haim, uh, is quite uh, representative. He is uh, present at uh, an affair that takes place in the city of Menemen, where he's a grocer. Um, where uh, Islamists are protesting against the government. Um, and he's accused, along with other people in the crowd, of clapping as the mob attacked and murdered a soldier. Uh, he says he didn't do anything, he didn't clap, he, but he was still, uh, he was still charged with, uh, charged with uh, disrupting the peace and put on trial uh, with, the, with a demand for execution. Um, so this sort of pressure was building on all sides of the community. And it comes to a head really with the trace program of 1934. Uh, this is a photo from Tekirda. Um, this is one of the most well-known and more discreet uh, anti-Semitic events of the Republican period. Um, as I said before, the state was trying to move all non-Turks basically to Istanbul uh, from the Thrace region, which is a border region with Greece and Bulgaria. This was a concern because the Jews were thought of as a fifth column. So the state thought that our families were potential traitors and spies, and that the, it would be better for them to be moved out of the towns they'd lived in for centuries to Istanbul uh, by force if necessary. Uh, the first impetus of this comes in law in 1934, which sought the set settlement of Jews in Istanbul and Turks in critical regions. Um, and it defines uh, Turkish and non-Turkish as not through citizenship, but those who do not speak Turkish as their mother tongue um, and those who do. So Jews who don't speak Turkish as their mother tongue, as in this area they're mostly Ladino speaking, are forbidden from re resettling in mass in the towns and neighborhoods where they're from. So once they're removed, they can never come back. Um, and the pogrom is incited uh, by a handful of Turkish fascists uh, named Nihalatsas and Cevat Uh Basically, they move to these Thrace towns. They print Nazi-influenced magazines. For example, you see here one of them directly copying uh, a Nazi cartoon and just translating the caption. Uh, and they are agitating the town's local population against Jews in Çanakkale, in Edirne, in Gelipoli or Gallipoli, the Dardanelles, Kırklareli, Uzunköprü, uh, and like three or four other towns in that region. The Jews become threatened. Um, their homes and businesses are looted and vandalized. Turkish neighbors murder a few Jews and some women are raped. Uh, the most violence occurs in Kırklareli, 
the events of this pogrom known as La Fortuna or the storm, uh, where clearly it was the worst. Um, so after attacking 65 homes, the mob in that city arrives at the house of Rabbi Moshe Fintz. Uh, they strip him naked and shave his beard. Uh, they also take all of his possessions and some claim that they also attacked his wife and daughter. So by dawn, we see that overnight, 400 Jews uh, leave. Uh, and as they leave their homes, they really don't take anything. They are not protected. And within a matter of weeks, uh, 13,000 uh, Jews leave Thrace, um, 10,000 of which happens within the first few days. Uh, and they mostly relocate to Istanbul, where the community there now has to take care of them as refugees and somehow find places to live and deal with this increased population. Um, we see in this period that Turkey uh, is, con is con following a policy of neutrality in World War II, but it's really affected um, by happenings in Europe, obviously. So we see uh, these ships bringing Holocaust refugees, uh, mostly from Romania, like refugees from all over Europe coming to Romania, taking ships to try to get to Palestine. Um, many of these ships malfunction because they're overloaded and too old and they get stuck in Turkey, but no one's allowed to leave because Turkey decides that it does not want to allow transit refugees in case they stay. Um, there's one famous example of Struma, which is a boat that was sunk in the Black Sea after having waited for entrance permission into Turkey uh, for more than two months, it was then denied. Um, but there's like many other boats that do get stuck and get turned away uh, and whose passengers were later murdered in the Holocaust. Um, there's also one sort of movement into Turkey, which are professors from Nazi Germany who were, dis, uh, who were decommissioned because of uh, association with Jewishness. Turkey admits uh, around 100 uh, and with their families and assistance, around 500 people displaced from Nazi Germany arrived in Turkey to basically establish the Turkish university system. And in Europe, uh, we see Jews from Turkey also dealing with uh, denaturalization of Turkish citizens for having left, uh, often on uh, technicalities like not having registered on time or not having the right document at the right time. Um, so this is a picture of the Izmir uh, Cavallero family who lived in France at the time. And um, they were denaturalized Turkish citizens and thus were able to uh, in Nazi, under Nazi law, uh, be uh, sent to Auschwitz. Um, so we see thousands of Jews who were in France at the time have to escape and hundreds of whom would perish during the Holocaust because of denaturalization. Um, and really emblematic of the 1940s is the rumor of the oven. Um, it's an untrue rumor uh, basically, that Jews in Istanbul and separately in Izmir uh, see uh, the building of a factory with a big smokestack and decide that this is near their neighborhood. This must be because the government of Turkey is planning to kill them in a mass oven uh, during the war once Germany invades. Uh, there's no truth to this, but the fact that this rumor became so widespread and was written down and was recorded really shows the mood of Jews in these cities at the time. And of course their mood was like this because at this period we see uh, direct attacks on them in different ways. So in 1942, we see the wealth tax uh, and it's a law that could not be challenged in court where non-Muslims had to pay taxes within 15 days in cash. Um, and they were charged at this rate of total wealth. So they had to pay more than the whole wealth they owned. Um, and the popular support for this law was prepared with uh, mostly anti-Semitic uh, targeting throughout the press for the year before. Um, and those who could not pay uh, were uh, sent off to work camps. Um, Around the over a thousand people went, uh, majority of whom were Jews, and the second small the smaller groups were Armenians and Greeks. Not a single Turkish person was sent to camps. 
87% uh, of the total revenue collected from this emergency tax uh, came from non-Muslims. Um, and in the press, they continued to be mocked, uh, even as they were sent off to work camps. Um, one example is my grandfather's family. And really, any Turkish family in Turkey uh, will have experience with this. Um, the conditions at the labor camp uh, were quite bad. They were sent to Eastern Turkey to Erzurum uh, in a town called Ashkale, where it was middle of winter and most of the work was breaking stones or shoveling snow. Um, there were also a few other camps throughout Turkey that did similar work like road building, but most of the most uh, obvious point was punishment. Um, concurrently almost, or right before, there were also the issues of labor battalions. Uh, the government of Turkey decided this was an opportune time in 1941 to basically use non-Muslims as free labor. Uh, so they were drafted uh, men from the age of 20 to 45. So people had to serve in the military, sometimes for the second time with their dad or with their son. So it really captured a long range, which is very unusual. And it only, it only encompassed non-Muslims. So Armenians, Jews, and Greeks uh, were rounded up to be put to work as free labor. Uh, they had to live in tents all around Turkey, building roads mostly. Um, and this uh, military service was of course not paid um, and included a lot of uh, a lot of uh, bad working conditions uh, for the people involved, especially for those who were older. Um, so we're running over time, but I'll quickly get through the post-war period as well. Uh, we see that after 1946, uh, Turkey transitioning to a multi-party democracy under the watchful eye of the military. Uh, the new prime minister, uh, who we see here, Mendes, a civilian, um, and there's some sort of Western orientation that is emerging. And automatically, basically, most Jews who had been uh, under the pressure of the previous government turned to the new party. So the party that had been running the country this whole time is now opposed by the Democrat party and all Jews become a natural constituency, basically, for this new party that provides hope. Um, even there's a discussion of whether the, the new party would bring back uh, would uh, pay back uh, the wealth tax that was uh, confiscated and apologize for it. Um, and uh, a Jew who got involved with the Democrat party and then became a parliamentarian, Salomon Adato, uh, was very clear about this. And this was also at, at the time when press freedom was uh, flourishing in Turkey uh, for basically the first time since 1908. Uh, it was a shocking, uh, moment, for example, for Salomon Adato to declare so clearly his anti-government sentiment. Um, he's both recalling the wealth tax and the labor battalions in this quote, for example. Um, and the press freedom also exhibits itself in the Jewish press. Um, we see an explosion in half Ladino, half Turkish, or mostly Ladino with some Turkish press. Uh, within 47 and 48, within just a few years, more than uh, five newspapers start. Three of the main ones are Shabbat, Atikva, and Shalom. Uh, the two others close. Shalom is still the main newspaper of the Jewish community in Turkey. Uh, but they come out of this wave as well after the war. Um, one other big development in this time uh, is the Foundation of Israel. And basically from 47, uh, around the UN vote, all the way into 50, uh, there's a mass migration of Jews uh, into Palestine and then Israel, um, which Jewish elites were trying to minimize. Uh, because basically what this mass migration is showing is that Jews are extremely unhappy <laughs> to continue to live in Turkey at that, at that time. This is right after the wealth tax. Um, so a big chunk of the poor population uh, leaves within a few years. So the Jewish population, which had already shrunk down to around 90,000, shrinks down within three years to 40,000. The population is basically halved. Half the population leaves 
in a mass migration to Israel uh, within three years. Um, and according to oral histories, many Jewish elites were actually quite pleased with the migration of the lower middle class mass uh, because Jews would become less conspicuous um, and there would be less Ladino shouting in the streets. Um, but we see basically because of the population shrinkage, uh, the, real, the reality of Jewish Istanbul is disappearing. Um, and we see the Jewish community shrink rapidly while Turkey is growing fast. So this is not just in this period, but throughout the Republican history, like we see Jews start from 1% of the country at 150,000 and continue to shrink in percentage and in number while the country goes from being 10 million 100 years ago to being 85 million now. Um, so the country explodes in population while the Jewish community keeps shrinking and shrinking. Um, this new period of the 50s also brings the restoration of the chief rabbinate, which I'm not gonna get into because it's quite technical, but basically it was not legally authorized for Jews to elect their own chief rabbi for a period, but this relative moment of uh, liberalism allowed for the official election of a new chief rabbi. Uh, but of course, this period is also tainted uh, by the Istanbul pogrom. Um, it was mainly uh, targeted at Greeks, but it really got out of hand, according to some reports of the instigators, um, where it was supposed to target the Greeks to force them out of Istanbul, but then became an attack on all minorities, Armenians and Jews included. Um, it ended up with uh, hundreds of uh, churches, homes, one synagogue, uh, cemeteries, businesses, looted, uh, multiple murders, sexual violence, uh, assaults of different kinds, um, and lots of looting. So that uh, event really uh, put the minds of minorities in fear. Um, one of the victims was a 65-year-old Jewish watchman uh, named Avramanov, who lost his life uh, guarding a store named Motola, which was a famous store in Beolo and Banju. Um, and uh, some of the Jewish, uh, some of the Jewish witnesses explained that basically the whole neighborhood of Beolo, but it rippled out. That was the center of the pogrom, but it rippled out, uh, was torn apart, uh, and people were cowering for the whole night, basically. Um, they destroy a lot of stores, a lot of homes, um, and that kind of caps off uh, this period that ends with the 1960 coup and the replacement of the government. Um, I know I just spoke a lot and I threw a lot of information at you. Um, so I'm gonna open it up to questions. Uh, if any of that was confusing or how it connects, uh, maybe we could talk about that or the period since then or the period before. So uh, I'll just stop there. Okay, well, thank you very 